Um, so with opium, you're looking at you know, a significant number of people um, that would be um, dispossessed uh, if you banned their crop. And I mean, previous opium bans in, in 2000, as you mentioned, and then the, the kind of subsequent localized bans under the Republic, they generally relied on favorable conditions, uh, namely high wheat prices, low opium prices, along with drought. And uh, wheat prices are very high now, admittedly, and drought is an issue. But the opium price isn't low at the moment. Uh, so the conditions that uh, enabled those bans to work, at least in the short term, aren't entirely applicable now. I'm Natalie Orpet, executive editor of Lawfare. And this is the Lawfare Podcast, September 14th, 2022. Amid the war and instability in Afghanistan over the last two decades, the opium industry has seen explosive growth. In fact, Afghanistan accounts for the vast majority of the world's opium supply. The Taliban vowed to crack down on the production of illicit drugs. In March, they issued a total ban on opium cultivation, which has stripped many rural Afghans of their livelihoods. But in the meantime, drug prices have been increasing, making production and trafficking of methamphetamines even more profitable. To discuss the situation, former Lawfare Associate Editor Tia Sewell sat down with Rupert Stone, an independent journalist who recently published a piece with the Atlantic Council entitled, Afghanistan's Drug Trade is Booming Under Taliban Rule. They discussed how Afghanistan's drug trade has evolved under the Taliban, the growing problems of addiction, and how the Taliban's role has affected the export and trafficking of illicit drugs in the broader region. It's the Lawfare Podcast, September 14th, Rupert Stone on the booming Afghan drug trade. To start us off, can you explain how poppy production has changed over the past year? In other words, how has the Taliban approached this illicit industry and what has cultivation looked like since they came to power? Well, basically... Taliban messaging on this issue has fluctuated um, since the takeover last year and vowed to ban drugs uh, in no uncertain terms. Um, The spokesperson, uh, Zabi Hula, at a press conference, I mean, uh, literally a a day after the takeover, I think, said that they would uh, ban narcotics. And then later that year, the spokesman came out on record and said they couldn't ban opium um, without first providing farmers with alternatives. Uh, And then they um, switched again, and in April this year, imposed a sweeping unconditional drug ban, um, which prohibits the production, trade, and consumption of all narcotics. So the rhetoric's changed. But rhetoric aside, uh, the Taliban's uh, essentially done very little to stop opium cultivation so far. Reports last year showed farmers continued to plant poppy. Uh, and in fact, cultivation seemed to be increasing. Uh, the trading of opiates continued in the open um, with little attempt to hide it. And as Afghanistan's economy collapsed due to the removal of foreign aid, which is most of the former government's budget, uh, imposition of, of sanctions, freezing of central bank assets, etc., uh, opium provided a lifeline to many poor Afghans. Uh, And also, importantly, it's quite resistant to drought, which is important in current circumstances. Now, the Taliban ban came after the main planting season uh, in late 2021, and it quickly became apparent that um, the regime would allow the summer harvest to proceed despite the ban. Uh, However, the um, decree did cause uh, prices to rise, uh, although they've since fallen back a little bit. Uh, So that's a kind of broad overview of of how things have been on the opium front in the last year. Thank you so much. Um, I want to dive a bit more into this decision by the Taliban to instate a ban. So as you know, the history of the Taliban and the opium industry in Afghanistan is incredibly complicated. Uh, The Taliban tax traffickers in the 1990s to then instating the first successful narcotics ban back in 2000, to then allegedly taxing poppy farmers to fund insurgent operations over the past two decades. So walk me through it. If you're the Taliban, why reverse course now and instate a ban in your first year of governance? 
particularly when you have extremely limited state resources, compounding economic and environmental crises, and an unprecedented number of Afghans dependent on this industry now for their livelihoods? Yeah, it's a a very good question. And uh, there are a number of reasons I can think of. I mean, the first one is we shouldn't forget uh, the religious motive. I mean, the Taliban is uh, generally very strict, as is uh, widely known, and um, they view drug abuse as morally wrong. Um, So there's that uh, motive to begin with. Banning drugs also reinforces their reputation as tough on law and order uh, and boosts their legitimacy by differentiating them from the previous government, which was notoriously corrupt and could never er eradicate drugs far from it. The drug trade boomed under under the Republic. Um, Drug use is uh, a social crisis in Afghanistan, and and there's an urgent need to address it. That's another reason. Uh, And perhaps the most important, in my view, is um, that banning drugs could possibly gain the Taliban foreign aid and legitimacy. They want clearly want development assistance, given the state of the economy, and a drug ban might be a way of getting it. I mean, when they banned drugs in 2000, Uh, They are promised aid and received some funding from the US government, which appeared to be a a reward for outlawing drugs. Prohibition could also help win recognition from foreign governments. I mean, so far, the regime hasn't been recognized by any government. And banning drugs and and kind of implementing uh, UN drug conventions could be a way for the Taliban to to play ball and um, try and gain some international credibility. Uh, and it's not just Western governments that the Taliban wants to impress. Um, they they set up an anti-trafficking unit um, near the Tajik border late last year, for example, um, which is likely in a, uh, an attempt to placate China and Russia, um, which worry about narcotics entering their territory via Central Asia. Uh, so there are there are um, various reasons for for imposing the ban. Absolutely. And a lot of those reasons seem to be pretty external facing insofar as establishing legitimacy. I guess, in your opinion, has this ban been more of a rhetorical show of legitimacy? Or do you see that the Taliban are actually taking concrete steps to counter the trade right now? Um, And if so, what are those steps? I would say so far, it's largely been symbolic, um, but not entirely symbolic. They have the, the, the Taliban regime has issued uh, quite a lot of propaganda, presenting an image of aggressive drug control. Uh, the Ministry of Interior earlier this year posted a photo on Twitter of a tractor um, tearing up a poppy field, for example. Um, they ostentatiously staffed up their counter-narcotics police um, after taking over, disseminating a video of, of that, and they sometimes publicised drug seizures and arrests. But uh, I wouldn't call their F, the Taliban's drug control efforts solely illusory. They are clearly doing things. Uh, for instance, they've um, shut some drug processing facilities in Helmand and Kandahar in the south, um, which is really the, uh, the epicenter of the Afghan opiate trade. There was one report uh, earlier this year that um, that I think 60 to 70 percent of the heroin processing facilities in in a border town in in Helmand on the Pakistani border um, remained operational. But still, that showed you that um, the Taliban had shut quite a few of them down, reportedly. Um, they did move also to eradicate some of the the second opium crop of this this year, which is much smaller than the first crop, which is planted in the fall. The second crop is planted later in the spring, and it, it's yeah. I mean, it's compared to the first crop, it's it's very very small, and and used not even to be recorded. But nonetheless, it, it is a reality, and and the the Taliban are doing something by cracking down on it. An interesting analogy in this respect is the, the a little known Taliban ban on cannabis cultivation in March 2020, which was um obviously a, a year or so before the takeover that that seemed to deter some farmers from planting cannabis, but only in provinces where the plant wasn't particularly entrenched. Um, In places like Kandahar, which uh, had a lot of cannabis cultivation, uh, one of Afghanistan's major cannabis producing provinces, the ban just wasn't really enforced. Um, So there's, I think, a parallel there that we can see a ban being selectively enforced 
a lot of symbolism and largely ineffectual, but it does have some kind of minor impact and can't be dismissed as mere symbolism. Right. Do you think that this will change moving forward? Do you think that, I guess, the enforcement of the ban will become more strong in the years to come, kind of reflecting on the the previous prohibition in 2000, where, as you note in your article, it took the Taliban numerous attempts and some intricate arrangements with different power brokers to truly enforce that ban? Do you think that the situation moving forward for a successful prohibition would be the same now? Or has this trade grown into something much larger that will be kind of, frankly, impossible to pin down in the same way? It depends on the drug you're talking about, really. I mean, basically, uh, the Afghan drug trade can be simplified into opium or opiates, opium plus heroin, morphine, the main derivatives, methamphetamine and cannabis. Those are the three main things. Um, so let's focus first on, on methamphetamine. I mean, they could possibly get away with a ban on meth and ephedra, its main um, natural ingredient, because the meth industry employs far fewer people than opium. Uh, it's only about um, 11,500, um, according to D- David Mansfield, who's, who's probably the, the top expert on the Afghan drugs trade. So that's really not a lot of people. I mean, obviously, a ban would hurt those people, and it would be difficult for them, and it would uh, it would have ripple effects in the economy, Afghan economy. Um, but it would be far less harmful than banning opium, um, which is you know a very labour intensive crop that during the war employed half a million Afghans. Uh, more if you include part time workers. More if you include the kind of service economy around the trade. Uh, and maybe even more now that the formal economy has collapsed. Um, so with opium, you're looking at you know a significant number of people um, that would be um, dispossessed uh, if you banned their crop. And uh, I mean, previous opium bans in, in 2000, as you mentioned, and then the, the kind of subsequent localized bans under the Republic, they generally relied on favorable conditions, uh, namely high wheat prices, low opium prices, along with drought. And uh, wheat prices are very high now, admittedly, and drought is an issue. But the opium price isn't low at the moment. Uh, So the conditions that uh, enabled those bans to work, at least in the short term, aren't entirely applicable now. The consequences of an opium ban could also be very deleterious for the Taliban, uh, robbing so many poor Afghans of a livelihood without any economic substitute Um, could fuel resistance against their regime, including uh, from its own fighters, who are in some cases involved in opium cultivation. I mean, the 2000 ban angered farmers and would likely have collapsed if the Taliban had remained in power. I mean, there were already signs before 9-11 and uh, the US intervention that year of arms being moved into the country and, and the first simmerings of violent resistance. So who knows what would have happened if it hadn't been for um, the Taliban's ouster that, that year. Um, militant groups could also exploit drug control efforts to strengthen their support, as, as the Taliban did uh, during its own insurgency against the former Afghan government. I mean, when the government launched eradication campaigns, the Taliban presented itself as a protector of opium farmers whose crops were threatened with destruction. And so if the Taliban were to ban drugs, the tables could be turned and Islamic State or other militant groups could, could do the same to them, um, take advantage of the, the grievances of farmers. So a drugs ban would be highly risky for the Taliban. It could threaten their hold on power, but they've not shown themselves to be wholly pragmatic so far. I mean, they ban girls from school, even though that decision enraged the development community and isolated the regime even more. So who's to say they won't take a a self-destructive decision to ban drugs? That said, uh, they could probably survive a drugs ban financially. Um, The Taliban's far less reliant on drug revenues than people think. During the war, drugs were commonly portrayed as the movement's main source of funding. They were described as like a narco-cartel, sorry, as a narco-terrorist group uh, of a drug cartel. Um, But uh, those terms weren't really uh, suitable because they earned less money from narcotics than 
than other sources, for example, from taxing legal goods um, that move through the, the territory they control, they earn more revenue, um, which was actually interestingly also the case in the, during their previous regime as they, they earn more money from taxing smuggled goods than, than from narcotics. And since taking power, they've, they've managed apparently to reduce smuggling uh, and boost custom revenues. Uh, so while drug money is certainly substantial, it's, um, it's not central to the Taliban's finances. I mean, they might decide to experiment with a ban, the Taliban, um, despite all these risks, on the assumption that they could roll it back if the effort backfires. But that would actually be a very risky move because the, the global drug market's um, different from the 1990s when they were last in power and they last banned drugs. I mean, this time round, if they cut off the supply of Afghan heroin, dealers could switch to fentanyl, as happened uh, in the US um, in a very short space of time. Afghanistan would then have lost its heroin market to opioids and uh, gone the way of other opium producers. Uh, specifically Myanmar and Mexico, whose um, plant-based uh, drug industries were transformed by the um, uh, synthetic drug revolution. I mean, synthetic drugs hold a number of advantages for traffickers over heroin. I mean, they're, they're cheaper, more potent, less bulky, easier to smuggle. Production's not confined to specific geographies. It's not vulnerable to drought, disease. Uh, so if you make drugs uh, in a laboratory, there are many advantages, and, and also it's secret, harder to, to detect. Um, so given these benefits, drug experts think it's it's only a matter of time before fentanyl displaces heroin in Europe and, and also spreads to the Asia-Pacific region. So uh, the Taliban, it could be damned if they do ban drugs because they could lose their market to opioids and, and damned if they don't because they'll be left with a vast uh, drug economy. So it's a hugely complex challenge. Hmm. I want to follow up on one thing that you mentioned in that answer, which is that there are really vastly different estimates for how much money the Taliban was actually making off of the drug trade during the war itself. And so just quickly, I'm curious, what in your in your view of this accounts for those disparities in figures in reporting as we saw over the past 10 years specifically? I think what one reason is the way the tax revenues are calculated. Um, I mean, there's a mistaken view out there that I think it's OSHA, the Taliban agricultural tax, is, um, is a tax on value. So like 10% of the value of, of drugs, of opiates or whatever, where it's actually the way it's calculated is, is um, a tax on weight. Uh, and basically, if you calculate it as a tax on value, you inflate the figures and make it seem like they're earning far more money from drugs than they in fact are. And when you apply the, the right calculations, you get much lower figures. So um, just before the takeover, there was, um, there was a report by David Mansfield again and Graham Smith, which was trying to assess the, the revenues for the Taliban and the former government in a single province on the Iranian border, Nimroz province. And they found that I think 80% of the Taliban's revenues came from taxing uh, legal goods through that province, and only 9% came from drugs. And interestingly, the government earned more revenue from drugs than the Taliban did. So, you know, when you calculate these things differently, it, it um, changes one's perspective. So as opium production has soared over the past two decades, addiction rates in Afghanistan have followed and, and at an increasing rate worsened. I assume that's true for the other drugs that we're talking about in this broader drug trade. So I want to understand here how the Taliban is approaching not just the production of drugs, but also the use of drugs. Is there talk or reporting of punishment or, conversely, any discussion of demand-side reduction measures like drug treatment facilities in Afghanistan? Yeah, again, good question. I mean, there's certainly a widespread drug use problem in Afghanistan, but the scale of it isn't really known as there hasn't been a survey for years. I think data from 2015, which I believe is the last drug survey that uh, was conducted there, 
uh, showed that more than 10% of Afghans were using drugs. And uh, the country's thought to have some of the highest rates of drug dependency in the world. I mean, the evidence so far suggests that the Taliban's handling of drug users is um, brutal. And we've had videos of addicts being arrested, beaten, publicly doused in water, their heads shaven and sort of marched around and then confined, um, often in prison, um, which is certainly a very... um, not an effective way of handling drug drug addiction compared to treatment facilities. Uh, and this is all reminiscent, actually, of the Taliban's previous spell in power in the 90s when they uh, they beat users as, as they are doing now. The, the Taliban broadcasts these images of rounding up addicts, no doubt, again, to present itself as a kind of tough drug cop. But while the brutality can't be denied... Um, they might be more negligent than they seem. I mean, many addicts are reportedly just left to die in the street and given no help whatsoever, not even not even arrest and, and confinement. Uh, and there was a recent harrowing story by the Associated Press with photos of these people in, I think, in Kabul, just, just dying, drug addicts just left to die under bridges, uh, surrounded by stray dogs, and, and even the dogs uh, were, were ho- hooked on drugs. I mean, that's how serious a problem it is. And there was a drug treatment professional quoted in that story, as I recall, who said he he um, thought the addiction problem was was getting worse. But without um, survey data, it's it's hard to tell exactly how how much worse. Right. So I want to turn this discussion specifically to center on drug abuse among Afghan women and children which, as you know, there hasn't been an official survey, but reporting shows that this has been a really massive humanitarian concern in recent years. So I want to ask, have you seen the Taliban signal in any capacity whether it may be committed to sustaining drug treatment centers specifically for these populations as a humanitarian matter, um, or whether it's kind of pursuing a one-size-fits-all crackdown on all users with those harsh measures I guess, specifically, have you seen any reporting on addiction treatment centers in Kabul being open specifically for women? No, I haven't. Uh, I mean, there are addiction treatment centers. I mean, generally in Afghanistan, women don't have equal access to health care. So my assumption is that they wouldn't get the same access to these sorts of treatment facilities as men do. Which is a big problem because if it's if that's the case, because there is reportedly a, a major crisis of drug use by women and children in Afghanistan. Um, I mean, I was reading that the number of uh, female addicts is estimated to, to have increased by six hundred percent in the last decade, um, according to the UN. And obviously, you've, um, the, the war-related trauma is um, a big risk factor for substance abuse among the many other problems um, that accompany life in Afghanistan these days, but especially for for women. I mean, one thing is uh, drugs are an antidote to hunger, um, which is at critical levels in the country. And they also serve as a sort of substitute, apparently, for for medicine, given the lack of access to healthcare. And again, that's a problem that's more likely to be worse in the female population because women have have poor access to healthcare. In Afghanistan, I mean, it should be said that Afghan women were suffering uh, long before the Taliban took over. Uh, I mean, it's long been known as the worst country in the world to be a woman, and COVID made the situation even worse. I mean, women were stuck at home with uh, with abusive partners and relatives, and again, they didn't get proper access to healthcare during that time. And their employment opportunities were were harmed even more. Um, so. All of these, this constellation of factors um, coming together now to make it a, a, a serious crisis, especially for, for, for women who are very susceptible to, to drug dependency. I mean, it should also be added that, um, I mean, Afghan drugs affect women in other countries too. A drug treatment professional in Pakistan told me um, that methamphetamine, much of which is smuggled into the country from Afghanistan, um, that uh, use of methamphetamine by by women trying to cope with domestic abuse and other stresses um, is a serious crisis in Pakistan at the moment, and I'm sure m- much of the meth 
that's being consumed there comes from uh, Afghanistan. So this is a regional as well as a, a local issue. I'm curious how outside researchers looking in at Afghanistan's drug trade have seen their work impacted by the Taliban's takeover, particularly as it strikes me that this regime would have some incentive to misrepresent cultivation data or, you know, limit survey access. Then again, I know that researchers like Mansfield have been able to generate really important research from satellite data alone. So is it your impression that it's become harder to study production trends in Afghanistan over this past year, or how has this effort changed? Yes, uh, is the simple answer. I mean, with the caveat that, I mean, the drug trade has always been partly concentrated in Taliban areas, so it was never it was never especially accessible before, but it has become worse, I think. Uh, I mean, media reporting in, in under the Taliban regime is very challenging and increasingly dangerous, it seems. And I mean, they've um, they've detained a number of uh, foreign and local reporters. And there have been recent scandals of reporters for Indian and uh, and American outlets um, being harassed and mistreated in in some ways. There's still some reporting going on, uh, including from Afghan outlets, um, but the space for kind of independent, informative coverage is shrinking fast. And that's very important because it, it makes it easier for the Taliban to disseminate propaganda, uh, kind of monopolize, monopolize the narrative and create this kind of alternative reality where they are actually cracking down on drugs and enforcing their drugs ban. And, and we have to be very wary of their efforts in this regard. I mean, they are, um, it's no endorsement of them, but they are very good at propaganda. I mean, it's one of the main reasons I, I feel why they, they won the insurgency. And um, you have to be, you really have to watch out for it um, because it can be um, quite ingenious. I want to move into another piece of this, which is its international dimension. And you present that in notable detail in your Atlantic Council piece. I'm curious, do you think that there's been a notable change in the export of Afghan drugs under the Taliban's rule? Certainly, trafficking out of Afghanistan has continued uh, at high levels, and it may well have increased. I mean, it's hard to tell with with a clandestine trade like um, drug trafficking how much uh, is going on, and uh, we have to kind of construct a jigsaw puzzle, um, you know, from seizure, drug seizure data, and, uh, you know, reports in the media, government reporting, price data, things like this, to piece um, a picture together of what's going on. Um, we don't have kind of finished uh, trade volumes um, that you get with um, legitimate commerce. But that caveat aside, it does seem like there's a lot of trafficking going on. Another thing to add on at the outset there is that um, uh, while there have been a lot of drugs seized since in the region since the takeover, um, some of those drugs might have left Afghanistan before the change of government. And, and then they've sort of taken some time to work their way through the trafficking pipeline um, before they were seized. Um, and drugs can be stored for a while and there can be, you know, time lags and delays um, in smuggling routes. Um, so that's another thing to bear in mind. Another, and also meth, you know, just because meth is seized in the region, it doesn't necessarily mean it came from Afghanistan. And there are other producing countries like the Netherlands. But the price of Afghan meth is so much lower than product from from Europe because it's made with a plant that makes means there's little commercial sense for for regional traffickers to source their meth elsewhere when they can get it cheaply on their doorstep from Afghanistan so anyway those caveats aside there have been uh, very large seizures and seizures actually at the border with um, Pakistan and Iran so you know when the drugs are leaving the country so it's like the, there's um, it's clear that they're being trafficked out while the Taliban was was running the country. Um, Southeast uh, Iran, for example, uh, which is one of the main trafficking routes, um, probably the main trafficking route for for drugs moving from Afghanistan to Europe. You've seen huge seizures there in the last year, um, including in recent months. There have been also Torkham on the Afghanistan-Pakistan border, as I say in my my piece. Um, There were unprecedented seizures of heroin and meth um, late last year, early this year. And Pakistani law enforcement officials told me and and other journalists that trafficking had increased um, since the Taliban took power. 
and then also the other uh, other side of the country, um, Central Asia, smugglings reportedly increased to Tajikistan, which uh, saw a, a, a rise in seizures. Uh, and the Tajik um, anti-drug chief said um, again that trafficking had increased since the Taliban took power. And uh, another important piece of the puzzle here, which isn't discussed enough, is um, is India, uh, which is in a particularly, I feel, particularly vulnerable position vis-a-vis the Afghan drug trade. I mean, its government's very worried that trafficking will increase under the Taliban. Um, we've already seen big seizures at um, ports in Western India since the takeover um, last year and this year. And even if the Taliban bans drugs, that could also be bad news for India because it has a large number of opioid users who could switch to fentanyl or other synthetic opioids like like tramadol, which are actually produced in India. And, and while we don't have widespread evidence of fentanyl use in India, it could be happening without our knowledge. I mean, India doesn't report deaths um, comprehensively. So, you know, we found during COVID that... Um, the WHO estimated uh, COVID deaths were 10 times higher. They're about um, 10 times higher than official reports. So these overdose deaths overdose deaths from, from opioids like fentanyl could be happening under the radar without our knowledge. And um, ultimately, we'd need to, to keep an eye out on that one. So circling back to end our conversation on Afghanistan itself, What role do you think countries like the U.S. need to be playing here? Or how should foreign countries and NGOs be considering the drug trade in the context of allocating humanitarian aid for Afghanistan? Yeah, that's a a difficult question. I mean, there are are never easy answers when it comes to to drug control. Sometimes the best that can be done is, is just not to make things worse. I mean, the international community will no doubt be tempted to provide aid. Uh, to Afghanistan in return for a drug ban to alleviate the impact on on dispossessed uh, poppy farmers. But attempts at alternative development, such as crop substitution, haven't worked well in the past, and they should be handled very carefully. And in the short term, the best approach might be just to focus on harm reduction, trying to improve the lot of addicts by providing dr- better drug treatment um, facilities and supplies, I mean, these aren't major steps that will eliminate Afghanistan's drug problem, but they could help people. And even small forms of assistance are better than no assistance at all. I mean, ultimately, the the Afghan drug crisis only be solved by economic development, and that's not really feasible as long as Afghanistan's sanctioned and and cut off from the global economy. The international community should be prepared to lift sanctions if the Taliban moderates its policies, but there's no sign of that happening. I mean, quite the contrary. The regime, regime's not only uh, caused outrage with its treatment of, of women and girls, it's, it was also caught hosting the chief of Al-Qaeda, um, which has enraged the US and, and other countries. And as long as these sorts of policies continue, it's hard to see countries such as the US, along with Russia and China, which share concerns about terrorism, agreeing to lift UN sanctions. And until that happens, Afghanistan will remain isolated and impoverished, unfortunately. I mean, one solution that's been floated in the past is to legalize drug production in Afghanistan. I mean, the Taliban was in talks um, recently with a German firm to open a, a cannabis processing plant, but that won't be possible unless the Taliban regime is recognized and holds Afghanistan's seat at the UN as, as legal drug production requires a license and uh, basically only recognized governments can acquire th- those licenses. Uh, there are many other obstacles to legalization, which we, we don't have time to get into beyond the licensing issue. But let's just say it's it's not a viable path. Uh, I mean, bottom line is Western countries should be cautious, encouraging the Taliban to ban drugs. I mean, a ban could destabilize Afghanistan again, plunging it into yet more violence and chaos, sending more refugees into neighboring countries, increasing the threat of terrorism, and ironically, creating perfect conditions for the return and subsequent expansion of the drug trade. And and in, in, a, in addition, as we discussed, the drug ban could open the doors to an opioid crisis in Europe, which isn't to say that, re, that, that reigning in Afghanistan's drug trade is the wrong approach. Uh, it just needs to be handled very carefully, gradually, within an overall framework of economic development and integration, and mindful of the failures of 
previous efforts during the Republic and, and before. Right. So in other words, economic development necessary to really truly counter this drug trade in a meaningful way by providing economic opportunity for Afghans and enhancing stability um, within insecure regions really can't happen without more of an official recognition of the Taliban from the international community, in your opinion. Yes, indeed. And 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 that can only happen if the Taliban changes its policies. Uh, you know, I, I just don't see governments recognizing the Taliban with its current uh, suite of policies. Uh, I could be wrong, but you know, even even um, China and Russia and Pakistan, Iran, which aren't exactly known for their championing of human rights, uh, uh, have serious issues with the Taliban regime. So, the isolation of the uh, quote emirate, I, I fear, is going to persist for some time. Well, we are going to leave it there. Rupert Stone on the drug trade in Afghanistan under the Taliban's rule. Rupert, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Not at all. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare material supporter at patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. And check out our written work at lawfareblog.com. The podcast is edited by Jen Patia Howell, and your audio engineer this episode was Ian Enright of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.